Today I'm going to detail about 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited and how it's associated with Nightcap and also Judith Garigian. And the company, 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited, was created by Cherie Stokes uh, with Yadaki Capital as the shareholder to purchase the property of 23 to 27 Waratah, which is this little piece of land here. Representing 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited, Derek and Cherie, calling herself Cherie Noble, approached the real estate agent that had had responses to flyers left in their letterbox about, do you want to sell your property? Now, the property in question here has a little bit of a story to tell even beyond the sale of it, which is, well, we'll get to it. At the time, there was a young woman living in this house at 20, well, it's actually 23 Waratah. Most people know it as 23 Waratah, but it's actually 23 to 27. And as is the case with most addresses that go from one number to another, if someone's going to shorten it, it will usually be the first digit. But in this case, to make it seem like it's not connected to that house, uh, the company was set up as 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited. So people commonly know it as 23 Waratah, so they wouldn't be looking for things about 27 Waratah. And it's only one of those small things on the title lot. The mail goes to 23, not 27. So it was very deliberate by the people that named the company and were purchasing the land to actually go right out of what would even be common and use the last number that an address goes to as their actual address for setting up the company name. Now, the young woman that was renting this property, the owners do not live in New South Wales. And when they received the flyer from the real estate agent, they were interested in selling the house. They did ask, are these people related to Night Capital or Buller Buller? Because we don't want anything to do with selling any land to any of those people. And the real estate agent, knowing full well that these people were associated with the nightcap development previously Bulla Bulla, said no. Now it was only after a contract was signed that we found out Cherie Noble was definitely Cherie Stokes and Derek was definitely Derek Zillman. And the 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited Company was set up to purchase that. So when the vendors found out that they had been lied to, they were not happy. They looked at getting out of the contract. But Derek Zillman, being the man that he is, had formulated a contract that was always beneficial to him. And despite being lied to and deceived, the contract was seemingly still valid. Now, at this stage, as soon as the contract was signed and it's going to be sold to 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited, this woman here that was renting the house was also working down here at the Mount Burrell General Store. Now, working in the store, as I dare say anyone that's working in the Yukai shop or any other shop with a notice board outside, knows that that is a community notice board and it's provided for the community to put stuff on. You do not police the community opinion. So this young woman is in the store and Philip Dixon comes in and makes a complaint about the notice on the community board that is not very complimentary to Bulla Bulla nightcap development. 
And Philip Dixon asks this employee why they are not performing a task that is not part of their job description. Very rudely, very arrogantly saying to her, do you know who I am? I own this. And at the time, Derek um, Philip Dixon was the director of Mount Burrell Commercial and hence the store. So in walks the director of the company saying, do you know who I am? And told her that he, well, he pretty much didn't like her attitude because she said it's not my job to look after the notice board. He didn't like that attitude. This young woman, within a very short period of time, was ambushed alone in her shop and then harassed by phone calls. The first ambush was someone walking into the shop with a, some, a letter, a threatening letter from Rose Litigation, Billy Fitzgerald, to this young woman threatening her, as is the usual standard, to put in there all this stuff about Gillian Norman and costs up to a million, we're going to sue you if you don't shut your mouth. Now this young woman had now received a threat for something that she didn't do and it's not her job to police the community board. But Philip Dixon didn't like her attitude when saying that it wasn't her job to do that. So she gets a threatening letter from Billy Fitzgerald suing her. This young woman was actually quite upset at the time. She was alone in the shop and at the same time after she got served and the person laughed at her, I think it, I think it was Mark McMurtry, I'm not quite sure there. Don't quote me on that one. But she gets a phone call from someone again laughing at her saying we're going to sue you for a million dollars. So this young woman who's an employee in a, in a shop was harassed and threatened by her employer. Then they sacked her. Now that wasn't enough for her because she actually lives up here in the property that they're now able to buy. And now, and it's even said in comments that they now even get to kick her out and she's got nowhere to go. How dare she not pull down that thing off the community board? It was not in a job description. She got threatened, she got harassed in the workplace and she got kicked out of her home. And Adrian Brannock just thought that was just the icing on the cake. It was so sweet. We'll show people what happens if you dare say a peep, anything about Nightcap or Bulla Bulla or the people involved will ruin your life. Well, certainly for the young woman involved, it was not a pleasant experience being harassed and threatened in her workplace over something that isn't even her job description. Uh, but uh, it worked out very well for this young woman. She ended up actually getting into a real operating community and having a share in that community. And it's not actually in the Tweed Shire either, which means that it won't eventually be shut down. So they did this young woman a favour because the only work in the area for miles around is these was these few shops. Other than that, as was pointed out in the planning meeting, there is a higher aged population in this area. And there's a very good reason for that. Because young people with families don't like the lack of infrastructure and facilities that they don't have access to in the country. One of the first comments that one of these city investors said was, where's the nearest playground? It's like, are you kidding me? You're standing in it. It's everywhere but for the failure of seeing what you've actually got because you don't know what you've got. 
Likewise, when all these people started invading this beautiful country area, they destroyed it for so many other people living around. But we'll get on to that in a little bit. Because the focus of this detailing of this part of the story is a land grab for 27 Waratah. And they were successful, semi-successful. The company that was purchasing the land, 27 Waratah Court, requested with the vendor to change the contract details. The only choice that the vendor had in these circumstances after finding out that they had been lied to and deceived and would not have sold the property to these people was to say, no, we are not changing the terms of the contract. So over the course between signing of contract and settlement, there were negotiations constantly going on in an attempt to get the vendor to change the purchaser's details on the contract. When they stuck to their guns and flatly refused and didn't make it easy for them, good on them, they had no other option. Now, there were two problems that they had at this stage. One, they couldn't change the, the purchaser, 27 Waratah Court. And two, they couldn't come up with the money to actually purchase it. But at the time, there was a woman that had already purchased several shares in Nightcap on Minjimble and had also made a loan of over 700000 to them. And that, this woman, Judith Garidjian, is the enabler at Nightcap on Minjimble that has financed them to enable them to keep going. So, and that's why I call her an enabler, because without the millions that she ended up spending and contributing, they wouldn't be even able to show up at the planning, planning, planning panel meeting and have their DA refused. So Judith Garigian is their enabler. She's been keeping them afloat. Now, the second the contract was signed, when 27 Waratah Court, uh, 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited, is still in Cherie Dixon's name as the Director and Secretary and Yadaki Capital as shareholder, Judith Garigian moves in and the first thing she does is get out a bulldozer. Let me show you. So the land hasn't settled yet and the first thing this non-purchaser just renting under the terms until the contract goes through gets out a bulldozer, even a renter wouldn't do that, gets out a bulldozer and starts doing what she wants. Just went for it. Now, she was sh soon shut down, as you can see from this lo lovely aerial photograph, that they were under observation the whole time, even before she initially moved in after the contract had been signed. So, since, uh, what was it, November last year, been watching the activities around 27 Waratah. And Judith Garigian, let's have a look at Judith Garigian. Oops. This is Judith Garigian. Now, from Nightcap's own records, she is stated to have purchased two shares as well as well, two shares in the community, as well as advancing a $700,000 loan to them. It's further that she also purchased the land at 27 Waratah Court for in the vicinity, I think it was 750000 Now, on top of all of that too, she also loaned them more money from what I was told, over a million. 
So all up, this Judith Garidian has forked over the best part of three million dollars. Now, right now, the only reason that the, the lights are on in the shop, any wages are getting paid, any lawyers are getting paid to threaten anybody, is because Judith Garidian lent them the money to do it. She is the latest enabler through all the funds that she has infused. Now, it might be all well and good if those funds didn't have to be paid back. But in the real world, there is, well, well over a million dollars owed by the development when they already would now seek to spend. Well, they've still got to come up with the money to finish purchasing and putting 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited back into their name originally. That is Derek and Cherie and Yadaki Capital. Because if we look at the ATSIC results, we'll just show you a little image that is made up of, oops, sorry. So this little image over here is um, a visual of what the company is. Shows the current and past shareholders and how it flows from one to another. Now I must say that 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited is actually one of the easiest ones to actually show. When you look at a pictorial of Mount Burrell Commercial, it gets quite twisted. But the short and the sweet of it is that 29th of October 2020, 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited was registered in Queensland. The registered office is Maduras Accounting, which is Peter Hetherington. He's virtually the registered office for all of their companies and the accountant as well. And that Cavalav address is, as I said, on pretty much all their companies. The principal place of business, Suite 403, 350 George Street, Sydney, New South Wales, is the one Derek Zillman used. So that hasn't actually been changed because even though it was a company purchasing the land and the land would be the principal place of business, 27 Waratah, they don't want to put it in those terms. So now you go through and the company was started off with 100 shares, $100. Cherie Stokes was the sole director and secretary and Yadaki Capital the sole shareholder. And Yadaki Capital consists of Derek Zillman as the director, as, along with Mark McMurtry. And they all hold shares, Derek Zillman in the name of Zillman nominees, Mark McMurtry in the name of First in Time, and Adrian Brannock through Nyepi, and moving the shares that he hid in his wife's name when he went bankrupt. So this was the startup company that was going to purchase 23 to 27 Waratah um, Court in Mount Burrell, the land itself. But due to the fact that the vendor would not change the name of the purchaser and th these people did not have the money, but Judith did, that's when the company was moved into Judith Lee Garigian as the director and her company holding the shares of Grace 88 Proprietary Limited. Now, all the documentation at ATSIC actually shows it's the 11th of May it was processed, received and effective from. But there is documentation that shows that directorships changed on the 5th, that, which means that that documentation that was received on the 11th of May, processed on the 11th of May and effective from the 11th of May, had contained within it the dating of when they wanted the directorships to cease from. So it would have been the 5th. Now, essentially, that should actually be 
in the ATSIC record when it says effective from, it should be effective from the 5th. I'm starting to find this discrepancy showing up in several companies where you cannot date the processed, received and effective from date, which is all the same to the date that then is said that a director ceased or another one took over. So this ATSIC extract done on the 24th of June 2021 shows the position after the original ATSIC extract, which I could show you is just these people, that it was changed out to Judith Lee Gurigian at the address of 3220 Kyogle Road, which is actually the commercial area. So rather than put down the address where she actually is at, which is 20 or 23 to 27 Waratah Court, because that's where she's living. Everybody knows this. She's that toffee nose on the, on the hill that come from the city that hasn't got a clue. And oh, I tell you what, just wait till you see what came out of her mouth. And it might actually explain how people like Derek Zillman and all these others can have this delusion that the failure that they've had, the blinding failure of complete and utter inability to meet all the legal standards required, they're just going to turn around and argue. You can't understand how they're going to argue it. And when you actually do hear their argument, well, you understand why they didn't give this information out sooner because it's laughable. It really is laughable. I, it was quite a letdown after months and months of being strung along about what this, these brilliant justifications were for breaching all these laws. To hear what you heard, it was like, seriously, I could have got a kindergartner to come up with something better than that. And they're actually going to be more believed than this guy that is supposed to be a knowledgeable lawyer, <laughs> knowing better that he's trying to argue such rubbish. I'm not going to get sidetracked with other people. We're going to stay on Judith. Because Judith is the enabler of Nightcap. If it wasn't for her sticking all those funds in and giving the, all that money over, and now all the, um, well, all the smart-ass comments that she's making about the locals around her, that she's moved into their home and destroyed their home, does what she wants and she's got the nerve to turn around and say that they don't have a clue. Right now one thing I'd have to say is that most of the investors that bought in in 2020 came from Victoria. No shocker. The, the lockdown provided customers for Nightcap on Mingimble and that's why as soon as lockdown stopped Judith did a runner and she's now living, well, she's been living at 23 Waratah Court since it was first contracted to be purchased. And she started bulldozing like she had some damn right. She didn't even own the land yet. They hadn't even paid for it. And, well, the council came in and after the council showed up, one of the people that was there with Judith didn't like the fact that people had complained about her gall and went and snapped all their trees off inside. They had to jump the fence to do it. So they trespassed on someone else's property to perform an act of spite. So when it came to 27 Waratah, essentially the land the contract went through, the sale went through, and 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited became the title holder of the land, and the controller of that company was the person who ended up paying the money for the land. Now, it's also said that uh, there is the buyback, you know, the original plan to start buying up the surrounding land to absorb into the larger development has always been forging ahead. And to spend 
all that money to try to buy land when you haven't even got DA approval or, or even a hope of one in the land that you've already got, which you still haven't purchased all that land. Those 16 lots of Peter Van Leishout still have to be paid for. The only thing that's been paid for are the two lots at 322 Cuyahoga Road. All the 16 other lots still need to be paid. So that's another debt, and that's millions. I think it's over 7 million that still needs to be paid. I'm not quite sure on that figure, so don't quote me. But it is millions. So millions on top of the millions that Judith has paid in, on top of the loans already existing through High Fusion Finance and Foundation Enterprises and Colmelair, there's all that crossover with the moving around of shares as it would appear that they've given more money and increased the share value that that mortgage provider or that loan provider actually increased it. So when they gave another 200000 the share value holdings in Mount Burrell Commercial changed. So there's this whole little story going on between High Fusion, High Fusion Finance, uh, Colmelair and Foundation Enterprises, which all of those revolve around Matthew Perryman and Brent and Rachel Delaney. So they are lenders. Then you've got the money that also has been lent by Craig Aldroyd. So millions and millions and millions of dollars that already exist in debt <laughs> and now you want to add to more land you see, the thing is that you need to stabilise your position before you extend it. This was not a very good financial decision. And in the long run, it might be for Judith because, well, she's still got the land at 27 Waratah. That's her home. She gets to live there. And now she also gets to pass herself off as a real estate agent. She's actually answering the inquiries because it seems like Nightcap Realty and Richard Mode have fallen off the rails and closed doors. So they have no, well, are you, Judith, are you a licensed real estate agent? Are you licensed to sell any of these things at Nightcap? Any shares in nightcap or potential shares so i'd say that you'd need to be and you'd also need to be um well mindful that selling a development is it's standard to buy shares in a development but it's also standard that when you buy those shares in a development that it has development application approval and it's also been through a certain number of stages through DA approval and completion. You're not buying shares in a development that is still a concept on paper, a dream in someone's head. There's something more tangible to it. And it's been through a, an identifiable process to state that the condition it's now in is acceptable that you can sell to other people. Now, they haven't worried about that process. They've just cut out, you know, when we get the DA, when we get the DA, when we get the DA. Well, they've been saying that for over six years. And only at the beginning of this year was there ever one DA that was lodged. One DA that could not even meet half the requirements in the five page set. It's not a big read, it's not hard to follow. And the excuses that they came up with to ignore everything. That, that nah, 
doesn't matter that it's a single lot we want you to look at it over here but multiple lots because if you look at it as a single lot we can't get any more than 80 houses so even though it's a single lot and mind you we haven't subdivided to get that single lot even though we will subdivide but when you look at it so that when we want to build 392 houses you look at it on those 10, 10 lots that have been changed from the 21 lots that we had before we did the subdivision that isn't subdivision. So you look at those 10 individual lots that make up the one single lot and apply the density cap on each one of those because it meets the criteria. It meets the criteria now before you do the subdivision. So after the subdivision, it still meets that criteria, but we don't want you to look at all those multiple lots because we need to make it a single lot because the SEP is very clear, single lot. So this is the kind of stupidity that the argument that they try and, I, I thought it was going to be a point of law that actually had some valid argument other than, well, really, most of it comes down to the only legal argument that they actually have is according to the opinion of one barrister. Everybody's pinning their, we can achieve this, on the opinion of one barrister, who when taking it to court, well, he might not even want to take it to court because lawyers have to state that there is a valid reason to instigate legal action. And in good conscience, I can't see how they could instigate legal action on so many of the grounds that they have come up with because it's ridiculous. You cannot try and say that single is multiple. You cannot subdivide and say it's not subdivision. There's all these contradictions that you would have people completely ignore. I, what do, do these people at Nightcap think the whole world's retarded? At the planning panel meeting, many of them appearing for the applicant, they would put forward an argument, but it was prefaced with, in my view. So in other words, not legally, but in their opinion, in their view, in the way that they interpret things. And that's the whole thing that the legality didn't stand up for the Tweed Shire Council. It did not stand up for the state panel and it will not stand up in the Land and Environment Court. It's the argument doesn't, none of the arguments that I listened to have got a leg to stand on and it is hinging around one opinion, one, when other opinions are sought. Now there are two independent opinions on which, what is the legal and reasonable interpretation of the law and the SAP, and you could go and ask another 10, 20, and most of those are going to come to the same conclusion as the Tweed Shire Council and the Department of Planning and Industries Legal Department. Not the State Planning Panel, but the Department of Planning and Industries. Now, they do talk about the Land and Environment Court and taking action there in the um, latest update from Derek Zillman. That's one of the options they're looking at, as well as other planning pathways. So what would those other planning pathways be? They can't go through the Tweed Shire Council. They can't go through the State Planning Panel. What are you going to do? Try and turn them all into individual rural land sharing communities and put in a DA for each of those under the SEP? which, oh, hang on, the Tweed Shire Council have removed themselves from the SEP. It doesn't apply and you can't lodge it. You can't lodge it. So where does it go? 
even if you win in the land and environment court, which you think you will with your brilliant arguments and you'll get approval, how are you going to build something that is then going to be prohibited at a local and state level? Are you offering something that great? You can't even secure any of the investors' rights, legal rights. And we will see when it all falls apart just how much strength is in those certificates and agreements that people signed believing it gave them some semblance of protection. No, it didn't. So after the failure of the development application for Nightcap on Minjimbal to even <laughs> be looked at really for approval, there's just too many breaches. They, they can't keep contradicting themselves in their arguments and use such pathetic arguments that aren't even arguments and expect that they can override the law and make others do what they would know would, to be illegal. And, well... After the 18th of August, things got a little bit interesting for people at Nightcap. And I went to look at Dreaded Cheetah's channel, which is the one that filmed all the official video for Nightcap, that hour-long infomercial that they call a documentary. <laughs> and for the second time, on the 19th of August, when I looked at this, the day after the, the DA refusal, it's like, oh... Dreaded Cheetah have hidden the official video again. Oh, they mustn't like the fact that, well, they obviously don't want people to be able to access that after the DAs got refused. Then there was a big meeting up at 3222 Kyogle Road on the 19th. Lots of cars and people up there reported by many people in the area and of note you know that um, aren't they still chasing down one man that coughed in an elevator <laughs> yeah we'll see how they go with that but anyway so the big meeting probably a, another crisis meeting where do we go from here and someone's got to lead the charge with the silver tongue and the spin on how this failure isn't actually failure, it's a success and an opportunity. Now Judith, living just up in Waratah Court and also selling shares and taking seemingly what seems to be charge of a lot of things, uh, seems to be taking the place in person of Derek Zillman's spin doctor and silver tongue. Now, the, before I get into that little story, though, I want to point out here that 27 Waratah, when it was originally started with Sheree and Jadaki Capital, these people in control of the company, it was originally done to purchase the asset, which they intended that they would have control over the asset in Waratah Court, as well as replace out all Darwin, Mark Darwin's shareholdings and uh, loved ones tribe's shareholdings with 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited. When that occurred, because Rainmaker Group Holdings, that is a major part of the beginning of both stories of Nightcap and Bulla Bulla because they are just name changes and a slight shift in focus so that they could still keep bringing in investors while they dropped the other ones off and got rid of them. So Rainmaker Group Holdings consisted of Adrian Brannock, Mark Darwin and Philip Dixon. Let me show you, hang on. Okay, so this is the pictorial, this is where I create them, uh, of Rainmaker Group Holdings. And as you can see here that 
it was originally um, Adrian Brennock was a shareholder but he held it through Boundary Properties and that was something that Adrian Brennock's father and brother were involved in and Christie took over the sole directorship and shareholdings of. And then those shares were transferred into Nyepi's name. At the same time, when he went bankrupt and transferred Nyepi into Christie, his wife's name. Also is Philip Dixon with Dixon Rainmaker. Uh, which has created an interesting scenario because Dixon Rainmaker has actually been deregistered. So it doesn't exist. It holds one third shares in Rainmaker Group Holdings, but it doesn't exist as a company anymore. So I don't know what's happened to those hundred shares. They are, well, go to the unclaimed money office or whatever. And Mark Darwin. First through Credit Clear Australia, then Loved Ones Tribe. That share then went into 27 Waratah, but then 27 Waratah went into Judas' name. So the current position of the majority shareholder in Mountborough Commercial Rainmaker Group Holdings is Nyepi, and, which is Adrian Brannock, and Judith at 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited. Philip Dixon is still supposed to hold 100 shares, but Dixon Rainmaker has been deregistered, and a deregistered company doesn't exist and cannot hold anything. So unless he re-registers that company and brings it up to date, those shares are locked in, well, you can't redistribute it's like those hundred shares went with him and yeah, it, it creates an interesting scenario when there is no deceased estate. If this was a person, you could go to the deceased estate and give the estate the benefit of the shares. But with a deregistered company, it just stops. It doesn't exist anymore. There's nothing to do with it. So that's the position with Rainmaker Group Holdings and the current majority shareholder, Rainmaker Group Holdings. With the 600,000 that they purchased the 1,200 shares with, that ultimately did come from the investors at Bulla Bulla. Now I was saying that dreaded cheetah hid the official video, but then a few days later, it's public again. So here it is on the 19th of August. As you can clearly see, there is no Nightcap official documentary. Then you go there a few days later, and it's back again. Now, the first time they hit it because of all the public backlash against the, the development. So after that, they just blocked comments. They thought it easier to shut down and censor, silence, censor and ridicule people rather than deal with the truth. And that would be the truth of other people's free speech to have an opinion that these two flakes have no clue what they've got themselves in for because they've been promised like so many other people. Oh, you can have this land, you can have a share. I mean, Max Egan's been given a share because he bought in people, and so they've got every expectation they'll get exactly the same because there's going to have to be at least one person that buys in off their official video and everything that they've put out there. And they are listed, Dreaded Cheetah are listed on Nightcap on Minjimbal's website as a sales lead. So that if you follow and click, how did you hear about us, dreaded cheetah? That's a feather in their cap, and that gets to be towards their free piece of land. Well, a free piece of land is all well and good, but there are people that actually paid a lot of money for the stuff that you sold for free and got paid for in the long run with a benefit that others had to fork over cash for. 
To me, that's not a fair and equitable position to be in. You can't turn around and say, well, I conned all these people into coming in and buying in, so I deserve one for free. Actually, you don't. But then again, you didn't fork over any money. You've got nothing to lose when it falls apart. And it's already falling apart. But it was interesting after Dreaded Cheetah made it public again. It's like, well, something really brilliant must have been said at the crisis meeting. I wonder what could be said where shit is sold as roses and you end up with a happy herd. And then I got sent a copy of a comment that Judith Lee on Facebook had said. And it was like, ah, oh. so that's why all these others are believing, you know, oh, it's not going to fall apart. A failure, you know, it's, it doesn't matter. You know, I thought they were in absolute denial, ignoring all the elephants in the room. But no, it's because Judith would have done such a good job at the crisis meeting. Oh, I'm a mortgage person. I'm a broker. I've done this. I've, I've done this all my life. I've, I've got all this position and wealth and knowledge. And because I'm saying this, even though you don't know me from a bar of soap and I could tell you whatever I want... Um, believe me because I'm telling you that I'm in the position to know all these things and when I say now they can go to LEC Land Environment Court and get a non-politicized lawful approval when I first read that it's like a non-politicized first of all everything about NICAP on Mingible is highly political it is anti-government. It is highly political. So you cannot take nightcap without the politics and without the extremism and without even considering, is this a domestic terrorist cluster? And what are their ultimate goals and outcome with their highly politicised and advertised infomercial where their ultimate goal is to get rid of the Australian government and laws. So they want a non-politicised one and also get lawful approval. So by that indication, Judith has just said that they didn't get lawful approval through the council or the state planning panel because it was too politicised. What a load of rubbish, Judith. You didn't get it because you can't get lawful approval for things that are illegal. Are you that much of a twit? Seriously, I think you've spent too many years in that smog line in Victoria. It has killed off too many of those brain cells. You cannot get lawful approval where half the things you're proposing are illegal. But now... She's going to insult the people where she's come and invaded the country with her stupidity. The clucking of the old chooks who have no clue is irrelevant. Awesome result. So, the failure of the DA at the panel was an awesome result. And it's because of the clucking old chooks who have no clue and are irrelevant. Well, those clucking old chooks... Judith, were living there in a beautiful country community. There was a thriving commercial district. There were events that happened all the time around the Sphinx Rock Cafe. There were things for children to go to, play group. There was a whole thriving, happy community where people came together. Then your boys moved in and destroyed it all. They've completely pulled apart the commercial area and destroyed the community. And you talk about the clucking old chooks who have no clue? I'd say you're the clucking old chook from Victoria under a smog line that's so brain damaged that you think setting up a city in the country is a good idea and that the people that live there 
that went to the country to get away from that should have to put up with your stupidity. 125 streetlights? Oh, no, nah, sorry. You moved to the country. And when it actually comes to why there is uh, an older population in these areas is because family and young people tend to go towards the city and infrastructures that they want. As they get older, the children grow up. They then don't have to be so close to all that infrastructure. They can then do what they want out in the country. They purchase land and most of those clucking old chooks that you talk about are actually running their own businesses and contributing to the economy. When they no longer contribute to the economy, they will sell off that land, go and live closer to the city and the medical facilities and somebody else, probably younger, but with money to still carry on being able to work out of home. Someone that has the financial disposition to support a home business. So it's got nothing to do with an aging population and you need younger people in there so that you can keep up a number of houses built every year. It's a matter of the reality of why people actually move to that area and why people would end up being forced to move away. There is a lack of work. You cannot have um, all these people come into an area and all of them have jobs. So they have to provide their own incomes and their own work, which, as I've said, those clucking old chooks that have no clue, most of those clucking old chooks are running their own damn businesses that you have come to the country and interfered with every single level of a happy community, a functioning community where people came together and helped each other. Now all you've got is a bunch of dead shits that go around telling people that, well, they're hillbillies, they're hicks, they've got no clue, and you laugh at them because you think that you are superior to them. But tell you what, these people, these clucking old chooks that are already in the country that you came and disturbed and ruined their countryside for, if the power went out, if they got stuck for days on end, they'd survive. Judith, if you couldn't go to a shop and buy what you wanted to, you wouldn't even know how to survive, would you? You wouldn't even know what plants out there you could actually eat. Or, yes, well, you don't even know <laughs> what the weather's like. <laughs> See, if anybody actually knew the safety risks and intended to actually live after building at Nightcap, nobody would accept the unsealed roads. People are going to get killed on it. And it's not going to be through any fault of their own other than the fact that going up that hill or coming down, the brakes don't work, the car, the wheel has no traction, it just slides and it goes where it goes. If you hit a tree full on, you might be lucky if you're backing into it and you hit it sideways, or it could be over a cliff. Who knows? People will get killed. And this one over here calls people that live in the area and know these dangers clucking old fools. So the awesome result of having the DA unanimously rejected by the state as well as the local council is an awesome result. It will speed things up. Would have been worse to get an approval. Oh, yes, wouldn't it, eh? And wait six months for council to appeal. Much cleaner and quicker this way. Loving watching this journey. A beautiful, intentional community in treaty with a fake tribe. No, she didn't say fake tribe. I'm putting in there. Treaty with the tribe? You're an idiot. You might as well go treaty with yourself for as tribal as what they are. But anyway, a beautiful intentional community in treaty with the tribe and a bunch of local old chooks trying to stop love and light. No, actually, Judith, it was your bunch of old chooks 
that came in and destroyed the love and light in an entire community. The neighbours from hell moved in and you have now facilitated them by lending them so much money. I tell you what, girl, you have got so much to answer for. And when you say good always wins over evil, your words are cheap. It's what comes and what is coming. What are you going to say when the Land and Environment Court laughs you out of court? What are you going to do then? You're going to say that's an awesome result because it would have been worse if they had said that your illegal activity was legal? So if I was you, Judith, I'd stick your head back into 23 Waratah Court Perhaps even wear a mask when you go out so people won't identify that you are the facilitator of Nightcap or Minjimble. Without your stupidity, they would not even be able to have answered, paid to answer anything. They would have had to have shut down and it would have saved a lot of people, a lot of grief and dragging this out. How long are these people going to drag it out and drag it out and drag it out? This is exactly... What happened to the investors at Bulla Bulla? And if you think that the outcome is going to be any different, why would it be? It's the same people involved and it's the same laws involved. It's not like anything has changed. It's just them still making a bigger thing. It's like, well, it wasn't okay as a little thing back then, but now we've made it a bigger thing and it's not that little thing. We must be able to get approval. And we'll just ignore things about water catchment and anything that is mentioned will bring up Logan City Council and the Gold Coast City Council, which is all concrete and buildings and no water catchment, and make a point that there is no requirement to do that in those Queensland councils. So again, you've got a Queensland firm trying to force Queensland city councils with no water catchment conditions onto the Tweedshire Council. Great projection. And that is their justification of why they wouldn't need to look at water catchment. So, according to Nightcap's own records, Judith Garigian paid 550000 for two shares and 700,000 loan to NCV Enterprises, two shares more. So that loan is secured by two shares. Further loan for 700,000 for two more lots to be repaid. Now the thing being is that even though Judith has control of 27 Waratah company and land, she has not been issued any shares in any company for all of this 1.2 million. She's received nothing. So when they say two shares and another two shares, there have been no shares issued in NCV Enterprises to her. And there have been no shares in any other company issued. The only reason that she has any connection and an even greater one now is through 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited. Because 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited, being part of Rainmaker Group Holdings, also has shareholdings in other companies. So 27 Waratah Proprietary Limited took the place of Mark Darwin's interests. So anything that Mark Darwin and AB had interest in with Philip Dixon and Cherie Stokes or Derek Zillman transferred over eventually to Judith. So now Ch Judith is one that is also reaping in from multiple shareholdings through different avenues in the member companies. Well, I think I've pretty much exhausted uh, what I wanted to tell you about the facilitator of Nightcap on Minjimble, Judith Garigian, and her role in 27 Waratah, the property and the company, and how she has enabled 
nightcap to continue. And everything that's been spent now is coming from money that has been loaned by people like Judith that they still do not have a share in. Now, granted, Craig Oldroyd was issued three shares in NCV Enterprises for his loan. But Judith Garidjian has been issued none, which, for the most part, most of the people that paid in last year have not been issued any type of share in any company, even though on their own records it shows that whether they would be getting a share in NCV Enterprises, Nightcap Village, Mount Burrell Commercial, or in the instance of where they've put in Wollumbin Horizons and Steve and Kelly McSween, which are, again, a crossover coming from Bulla Bulla. Now, as this has already got really long, I'm not even going to try and show how it all starts at the same place. And the commercial aspect that was being kept separate for the reasons explained in the Voxes, when they detached the past lost investors, they just took the commercial part that was intact already that was supposed to work jointly with the Bulla Bulla community and just cut loose the Bulla Bulla investors and started pouring in new investors into the one that started in June 2015. In June 2015, they started Bulla Bulla, they purchased Bulla Bulla and they also started preparing to include and were including the Mount Burrell commercial area and buying the commercial district. So on that, I'm going to leave it and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.